Yes, sir, because it is like there are certain these things, I think, because of these only. Little bit better, I think. Uh -huh. Are you able to see me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Wagner is also on the screen. Oh, yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? My big pleasure and, and honor to be again with you. <laughs> the pleasure is mine and the pleasure is all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that we will uh, enjoy an interesting uh, virtual lecture this afternoon. Yeah, I'm very sure every time that we hear you, every time we yes, interact sir. with you, we always stand to gain. You know, yes, not only it is interesting, it is very useful I'm and it, it is very, very appropriate. And it is, it is, it's a total update on our knowledge base. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. So we we'll wait for a while till some more colleagues join in. We That's fine. Although it is time here, but the Indian clock is three. But I think uh, Sunil ji, we will wait for a while. Sunil, <coughs> who's there online? Sunil, Kalpana, anybody here? Okay, I think we'll come. आपका चालू हो गया आपने किया आपका है हेलो वाला चालू हो गया क्योंकि मैं मैं बोला मैं पूरा नहीं देख पाऊंगा So, Dr. Wagner, meet our new secretary general, Mr. A.K. Dinkar. Good afternoon, Mr. General. A big pleasure to be with you this afternoon.
Tinkar sir, your speaker is on mute. Can you unmute it? Hello. Yes. <laughs> what is the position of Corona? Hello. Am I audible? Hello. I think I'm not audible. Yeah, yeah, we can. और कोई इंट्रोडक्शन तो नहीं करनी हां जैसे साहब का तो हो गई है इंट्रोडक्शन कर लेंगे जरा तुम्हें बता दो क्या कर रहा है और गुड आफ्टरनून ये ये सुनिए डॉक्टर वगनर आर यू आर यू कनेक्टेड नाउ I am ready, but the presentation is not on my computer right now. Yeah, you, you are connected. I can see you on the screen. Okay. Okay. Let me make my introductory remarks. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, those who are connected with us on this session for the virtual training. As is customary, I think we must uh, acknowledge the fact that we are passing through. really very very difficult times while all over the world the scene is bad but specifically speaking in india the situation is really bad at this point of time we have large number of cases and uh, all that one can say advise each other stay safe stay healthy stay home look after yourself look after your families look after all those people who need you whether by connecting with them or by physical assistance whatever it be and a word about the telling association of india you are well aware just to recapitulate telling association of india works under the umbrella of central board of education and park Joined the International Tunneling Association (ITA) in the year 1976. As on today, we have more than 600 members, and we are expecting more and more people to join us. In our mandate, we deal with anything and everything that deals with tunnels and underground space. We are a single platform for exchange of information, for conducting trainings and seminars, studies, workshops. <clears throat> also, technical literature and journals. We are the official link with the ITA, and we represent India at ITA as a member nation. We are also responsible for hosting World Tunnel Congress, as and when it is given to us. In addition to that, once in every two years, we hold a meeting and host a meeting called Tunneling Asia, where we also do something called the Tunneling Asia. Awards. We are the agency which is primarily concerned at all times with the safety in the field of tunnel. And like we inform every time, we have a new feature added to us, which is more than two years old now. The Tunneling Association of India Young Members. Even that organization is very strong and growing. In addition to us, there is a small organization called the Center for Excellence for Tunnels. at a government organization called the National Highway Infrastructure Development Corporation Limited in HIDCL which is also in platform for advancement of tunnel development works in india they also focus on the thought leadership strategic advice and problem solving uh, inputs the two of us that is the tai and the center for excellence coordinate and collaborate with each other Okay, this is the background. Now, a uh, word about our speaker for the day. Once again, Dr. Haral Bhatia. I think every time I introduce, I all short of words. He is such a multifaceted personality in the field of tunneling. He is worldwide a renowned person. You all are aware that he not only he has done his 
masters. He's done his research also in this field. He's a licensed master builder. He's a government counselor. He's a chartered expert at the court. He has been a consultant at the World Bank for more than 15 years. And he's an international consultant of the underground structures. He's got more than 40 years of experience in terms of design, construction, teaching, and consultancy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what is added to his uh, portfolio that he has also been a teacher and as an assistant professor at the University of Graz, which is a very well established and renowned university in the world. He's been a vice president of the ITA and he serves as an expert member on the executive council of the ITA. I can go on and on. This, in a very short, is the introduction to our speaker. Coming to the subject for the day, now he's chosen a very appropriate subject, contract models and risk assessment. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that there are three key principles as far as the field of tunneling is concerned where we can land up in, in problems. One is the investigations, geotech, hydrological, geophysical, the entire package of investigations has to be complete and very, very accurate. Today, the technology permits us to do that. It is not the money wasted. It is not the time wasted. Second is the robust design. We have various options. Designers can develop a design, but whatever design is chosen and developed, it should be very robust. It should withstand those conditions under which the tunnel has to be constructed and a designer should be able to foresee the problems. Third and the most problematic area is the contract model. Now, we are all aware that despite the best of the investigations in the field of tunneling, some surprises do come up. Some changes do happen. Now, you should choose a contract model which permits you to make changes as the changes happen. Otherwise, there is always a conflict between the employer and the contractor. So Mr. Wagner is going to be speaking to us on the contract models and risk assessment. You know, the risk is, is it has to be assessed in a proportion beforehand that, okay, if this happens, who's to be taking the risk? He's going to be speaking to us on the guidelines, on the geology and hydrology, on the methodology, ABM, MATM, ground structure, ground support, hazards, and the risks. So the topic for the day is very appropriately chosen. Once again, welcome on board, Dr. Wagner. Over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. I feel uh, a little bit ashamed that uh, uh, I'm not uh, that uh, number one in the world uh, of uh, tunneling. I just try to be a genuine, genuine uh, member of the Tunneling Society uh, of the International Tunneling Association. <clears throat> Two is that uh, I have been for a very long time uh, working uh, in the tunneling industry uh, and I started very young. Uh, when I was uh, in, in 1961, when I was working on a hydropower station, which was the most re remarkable hydro hydropower station at that time in the central Alps of Austria by the name of Caprum. And uh, that uh, enthusiasm uh, has been uh, carried on in my whole uh, professional life until today, actually, and until today that uh, I have gone through uh, lots of phases uh, in design and construction, through lots of phases uh, of different types of uh, uh, applications for, for tunnels. And some of these uh, experiences I would like to share with you today. Uh, in particular, as it has been uh, introduced by His Excellency General Sharma, uh, in particular uh, with respect to, to uh, 
the contracts which we use and uh, to underline the importance of contracts and contract models and also to improve and to deepen the understanding of contract models and how they are interrelated with uh, risks and how we uh, do risk assessments. So that, that is the, the point of, of view which I would like to uh, convey to you today. Okay, uh, so maybe we start with the second slide after this introductory slide. But I, I once again have to, to mention that uh, I cannot see the full picture of the slide on my computer. Uh, there, is, there is one line which we could eliminate last time and maybe Mr. Uttaram can uh, eliminate also so that I have the full picture of the slide. Uh, if, if not, then it's uh, also no problem. Okay, so uh, a brief overview of uh, what kind of uh, lectures uh, over the last 10 months uh, have uh, happened and have been uh, lectured. And that was uh, tunneling technologies in design and construction, construction concepts, maintenance and repair, design of tunnels and caverns, uh, and and also uh, and also uh, contracting practices, which has been a World Bank seminar. Uh, then also some design guidelines with regard to a new Austrian tunneling method, or as we call it in International Tunneling Association, uh, the conventional tunneling method, uh, uh, in contrast to the tunnel boring machine. Uh, TBM technologies, and I should not say in contrast, because nowadays we know that uh, both of these technologies are very close together, and one has learned from the other one. Uh, the last uh, lecture will be in May, and I would like to uh, put your attention to the lecture title Life Cycle Assessment, uh, which uh, has to be confirmed. It has not yet been confirmed, but it has to be confirmed for the uh, 19th of May. So I would, I would like to ask you for that confirmation. We can go to the next slide, the next slide, uh, which shows the content of uh, today's presentation. And uh, I will start with an introduction or what I call a preamble. And uh, in the preamble, we uh, are challenged both by contracts and by risks. And after we have talked about uh, these challenges, uh, then uh, I will talk about the interrelationship between uh, contracts and risks. And also, uh, we'll talk about uh, salient features of construction contracts, in particular, of course, tunnel construction uh, contracts. I will uh, give a few words also to engineering project development. Before coming uh, to the FIDIC uh, Emerald book, which is a new uh, book from the uh, FIDIC Association, in, in Lausanne, in Switzerland, uh, which uh, is uh, giving a very comprehensive picture of the role of the contractor, of the role of the designer, the consultant, and what the responsibilities are, including also uh, some recommendations for, for the development of contract documents. Then I will come to the different types of contracts and talk about uh, uh, EPC, Engineering Procurement Contract, which is a very, a very attractive uh, uh, and, and very much and more and more used type of contract. Then I will talk about risk register and uh, risk assessment uh, process, as well as uh, talking about risk uh, uh, assessment matrix in order to help uh, to uh, make an evaluation of risks. And finally, uh, I will talk about uh, the critical path of uh, 
any projects uh, in the underground world and give you a summary. So we can go to the next slide. Okay. Now the, the next slide is uh, part of uh, part one of uh, two slides, uh, which one uh, first of all talks uh, about the challenges uh, by the contract itself as such, and uh, also about challenges by the risks. So let me talk about uh, briefly about infrastructure projects, which usually are multi-billion dollar developments, uh, such as tunnels and bridges. There is a paradox uh, in mega projects, and we are having more and more worldwide, not only in India, but also on a global uh, scene, we have more and more mega projects. Uh, and uh, it is pointed out that more and more of these projects are becoming implemented, but they typically perform poorly. In particular, the insurance industry has been uh, affected by poor uh, performances, often uh, showing substantial cost overruns and market shortfalls. I give you two examples or three examples uh, the very well-known channel tunnel, which opened in 1994 at cost of uh, 4.7 billion pounds. Uh, pound is uh, nowadays almost the same uh, as, as dollars. And there was a cost overrun of 80%, which caused several companies and banks nearly to go bankrupt. Uh, actually, uh, at the channel tunnel financing uh, institutions, there have been more than 250 different banks which have been involved in that uh, huge uh, mega project. Another mega project uh, is the Denver Airport, which cost uh, $5 billion and it has opened in 1995. Uh, following a 200% cost overrun. There were also problems with the Hong Kong Czech Club Cock Airport opened in 1998, which had low revenues and negatively affected Hong Kong. But a very famous, uh, famous airport. Those who have been in, in Hong Kong know that uh, the old airport was just giving you the feeling as a, as a passenger in an airplane when you landed in Hong Kong that you will run directly into the mountain. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. And the next slide uh, shows you some, some challenges, some challenges uh, by risk. Actually, poor performance is reasoned by process participants having intentions generally to underestimate costs and to overestimate revenues, again, to undervalue environmental impacts and to overvalue economic development effects. Okay. So the core problems are the lack of accountability and inappropriate risk sharing, which can be improved by reforming institutional arrangements of decision making and the choice of contract model and risk assessment by instituting accountability at project development. Uh, Maybe, Mr. Uteram, you once again try to give me a full picture of the slides. I, I still have a problem to not to see the, the full picture. Okay, let's go to the next slide and, and uh, hopefully you can eliminate that, that line which covers uh, the lower part of the uh, slide on my, on my, on my uh, computer. Now let's talk about the interrelation between contract and risk and start with the hazard. The identification and management of risk to ensure 
their reduction to a level as low as reasonable practicable, which is uh, known by the common term of LAP. LAP means as low as reasonable practicable. And that shall be integral consideration in planning, design, procurement, contracting, and construction of tunnel works. So that is the, uh, uh, the uh, definition of hazard. Risk, uh, in particular, so far as reasonably practicable, should be reduced through appropriate planning and construction procedures. Now, uh, with regard to management, management, uh, the responsibility for risk management shall be explicitly allocated to relevant parties to a contract so that they are addressed adequately and appropriately in planning and management of a project and that appropriate financial allowance can be made. So this is very, very important because engineers, in my opinion, have a tendency to dream. And uh, the dreaming starts when a project starts, the dreaming starts that uh, uh, the money is uh, something uh, which is always available and uh, indefinitely uh, available. But the real fact is different. The real fact is that uh, the project has to have allocated financing at the beginning of the project. Uh, but that touches, of course, the subject of cost estimate. Okay, so the procedure is the use of formal risk management, uh, which shall be employed as a means of documenting formally the identification, evaluation, and allocation of risk. Risk, why is risk so important, uh, so more important in underground works and tunnels as in above ground works? Because in above ground works, the risk, okay, is, uh, is allocated to the foundation. But once the foundation is done, whether it's shallow or deep foundation, once the foundation is done, everything on top of the foundation, may it be a bridge, may it be a high-rise skyscraper building, or may it be anything else, everything above ground is more easy and less risky uh, with regard to, to uh, a calculation and evaluation. Now let us talk about the next slide on uh, construction contract and salient features. I would like to define what is a contract. A contract is a mutually and legally binding agreement between two parties based on policies and conditions recorded in a document form. The parties involved are the property owners or owner, and the contractor or contractors. Sometimes we have joint ventures, sometimes we have uh, subcontractors. It will be elaborated uh, furthermore in the coming slides. So the owner is also called the employer or and the client has the full authority to decide what type of contract should be used for a specific development and to set out legally binding terms and conditions in a contractual agreement. The construction contract is an important document as it outlines the scope of the works, it outlines the risks, the duties of the people involved and the legal rights of both the contractor and the owner. Maybe Mr. Utteram, you still can try to uh, clean my picture on my, on my computer. Let's go to the next slide and talk about the form of contract. The form of contract immediately uh, raises the question of the base date. Can we, yes. 
The, the base state can be used on projects to allow the changes to the contract uh, sum, to the contract amount, or sometimes extensions of time, or even to determine which rules will apply to the contract. For instance, uh, uh, with regard to arbitration rules, provisions will depend on the specific form of contract which being adopted and applied. There are also joint contract tribunals in design and build contracts, a special type of contract, where the base date determines the allocation of risk in relation to changes in statutory regulations, changes to value uh, uh, added taxes, exemptions to VAT exemptions, and changes to definitions of day work. Okay, what is a, a standard building contract? Uh, changes to statutory requirements after the contract's base date, then the contractor must, must after the scope of work to comply. The change will be deepened to be a variation for which the contractor is entitled to be paid even if no formal instruction has been issued. That is the subject of claims. It's generally uh, uh, known as claim and claim management. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide talks about change conditions. Again, the base date is the reference date from which changes in conditions can be assessed. <clears throat> that is very important as uh, changes are happening outside or beyond the contract, but have to, be con uh, have to be considered in the contract. The inclusion of the base date is generally used as a mechanism for the allocation of risk between owner and contractor for changes which might occur in the period between pricing and signing of contract. So that, that is important uh, because, again, it is beyond our control, could be beyond our control. This reference date from which uh, conditions under which the tender was prepared are considered to have been known by the contractor and are properly reflected in the price. Yes, uh, that is why the base date is such a key element in, in the contract. And the specified conditions uh, can change, but if they change before the contract is implemented, then the contract may have to be adjusted to the changed conditions. Okay, uh, next slide uh, is just a brief uh, repetition of the development of uh, phases for engineering projects. So after a project has been initiated, it goes into the stage or into the phase of planning and design. In that phase, uh, uh, is the following uh, of the execution and the monitoring and controlling. Execution and monitoring and controlling are, I would call it, uh, by handed uh, procedures. And finally, and finally, we come uh, to the stage where we have the closing of the project, which is uh, after finishing the project. Uh, let's go into the next slide and talk about project development with regard to groups of uh, pro process groups. Okay, so the process uh, after initiating uh, goes into planning and from planning, it goes into monitoring and controlling and from planning and monitoring and controlling and uh, also into execution. And uh, after execution, uh, we have uh, the closing of the project uh, 
from the point of view of technical and financial aspects. Let's go to the next uh, uh, important subject of this presentation, which is the Emerald Book or the Fidic Conditions of Contract for Underground Works. This uh, Fidic Emerald Book is one out of uh, a series of uh, Fidic books, uh, the Red Book, the Yellow Book, uh, the Silver Book and others. The Emerald Book is new book, uh, which has been launched at the World Tunnel Congress uh, 2019 in Naples in Italy. What are the aims of the FIDIC conditions? The aims are to present uh, on a global scale the consulting engineering field by promoting interests of companies and interests of engineers supplying technology-based services for the built and natural envir environment of uh, tunnels and underground works. <laughs> FIDIC is known for work in defining conditions of contract for the construction industry worldwide, and it has been acknowledged at that. Conditions are designed by the contractor according to the reference design by employer and geotechnical baseline report. We have been talking in previous lectures about uh, the importance of geotechnical baseline reports. This is again underlined uh, in the FIDI Conditions uh, Emerald Book of 2019. Okay, so uh, uh, the conditions include an extensive guidance for the preparation of tender documents and examples from for schedule of baselines, the completion schedule and schedule of key equipment also. So this FIDI conditions gives us these baselines in uh, multiple, multiple aspects. Uh, let us talk about the geotechnical baseline report. Uh, maybe Mr. Uteram can once again try to eliminate the uh, line which is covering my, uh, my uh, screen. The geotechnical baseline report is defined as the single contractual source of risk allocation related to subsurface physical conditions to the parties. Everything in underground works is related to that risk, to that uh, physical condition in the underground. Equally important to the physical conditions of the ground, uh, the uh, GBR, the Geotechnical Baseline Report, addresses the reaction of the ground to excavation and support under the contractually agreed construction methodology. So uh, let me once again underline two different aspects uh, of uh, conditions uh, which we have to consider. The first condition is the geology as such, and the other condition is the geotechnical behavior, uh, which is uh, caused after excavation and installation of the support under the contractually agreed construction technology. All subsurface physical conditions not addressed in the geotechnical baseline report are to be considered unforeseeable. So what is, what is unforeseeable of course, cannot be covered unless uh, there are uh, very, very experienced uh, geologists, geotechnical engineers, which have a feeling for what is uh, uh, what can be considered. The risks arising out of foreseen properties of ground, obstacles, and adverse reaction to the excavation and ground support processes are assigned to the contractor, as well as the production rates and cost of performing the works under the same conditions. 
So this is contractor responsibility. Arising out of foreseen properties of ground. But there are other risks arising out of unforeseen physical conditions of the ground, obstacles and adverse reaction to the excavation and ground support processes are allocated are allocated uh, just a moment I have to check it up are allocated uh, will the the remainder allocated to the I, I'm, I'm still uh, fighting with my screen because uh, it, is, it is covering my screen. Are allocated and, to the warranting extension of time or reimbursement of cost to the contractor. Right, right a moment, just a moment. We are talking about risk arising out of foreseen, out of unforeseen physical conditions uh, of the ground, obstacles and adverse reaction to the excavation and ground support processes are allocated to the employer warranting extension of time and or reimbursement of cost uh, to the contractor. So that, that definitely is uh, unforeseen and that is not the risk of the contractor. That is the risk of the owner. And the risk of the owner uh, has to be covered by payment to the contractor. OK, so that was uh, uh, the essential features of the geotechnical baseline report. And let's go to the next slide on the guidance for preparation of tender documents. OK. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Uta Ram is here, but last time he could clean my uh, my uh, 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 screen on, on, on my computer, which uh, still is a problem to me here. Okay. The cost of excavation and lining works depend on the subsurface physical conditions and or ground reactions to the, uh, to the respective works. So the conditions which provide that the ex excavation and lining works are to be measured and paid for using rates and prices set out in the bill of quantities. The bill of quantities is an essential part of the contract documents, of course, and uh, essentially uh, also connected uh, with the design. Under these conditions, it is the contractor that measures the as built quantities, which are then agreed or determined by the engineer. So uh, uh, this is uh, according to the uh, FIDIC uh, Emerald book, uh, uh, the regulation and the management of uh, uh, the prices. With regard to the time, uh, due to the typically long duration of underground works, and to the high cost investment in equipment, an important portion of the cost of the contractor, such as, for example, depreciation of and uh, interest for equipment, overhead charges, and so on, is time related with the remainder of cost depends on volume or quantity for performed works. The bill of quantities for excavation and lining work should therefore distinguish between time-related rate items and quantity-related uh, rate items and, and fixed uh, rate items for the performance of the works. So uh, let me, let me uh, maybe you have a better picture than I have, but uh, let me still uh, underline these different types of rate items First, the time related, second, the quantity related, and third, the fixed rate related items. 
Now let's go to the next slide with regard to contract types. There are three types of contract, of construction contract, which are identified according to the mechanism for calculating the sum due to be paid by the employer. And these are typically, uh, I, would, I would call it uh, the, the main uh, construction contract type, lump sum contract, remeasurement contract, and cost reimbursable contract. The types vary from project to project with regard to who takes the risk involved, which party has to pay for the cost overruns, and which party can keep the savings if the project costs are less than the estimated cost. So uh, these are the, uh, I would say, the cardinal types of contract in, in fact, in practice, and I will show you a number uh, of uh, different uh, types of contract examples that uh, these contracts uh, derive from project to project. Okay. <clears throat> there are other types uh, of contract and descriptions of contractual purpose, which could include the so-called percentage rate contract, the item rate contract or unit price contract, the lump sum and scheduled uh, uh, contract, the cost plus fixed fee contract, the cost plus percentage of cost contract, and a subcontract agreement arrangement contract. So let's talk a, a, a little bit about uh, the percentage rate contract in the next slide. Can we go to the next slide? Slide number 16. Okay. It's on the screen. No, it's not on the, now it's on the screen, yes. Okay. Uh, what is the role of the construction manager? The construction manager acts as a consultant to the owner in the development and design phases, so-called uh, pre-construction services, and as a general contractor during construction. The contract manager is bound to guaranteed maximum price, so-called GMP, where the fundamental character of the relationship is changed. In addition to acting in the owner's interest, the construction manager must control construction cost to stay with the guaranteed maximum price, GMP. The construction manager at risk special type is a global term for referring to the business relationship of a construction contractor uh, of the owner and the architect or designer. Construction manager at risk arrangements eliminate a low bid construction project. A guaranteed maximum price agreement is a typical part of the construction manager and owner agreement comparable to a low bid contract, but with adjustments in responsibility for the construction manager. The construction manager at risk arrangement is a budget management. Before a project design is completed, the construction manager becomes involved with estimating the cost and constructing a project. The advantage is balancing of cost schedule, quality, and scope design, which may be modified instead of redesign. Uh, and as an example from the Izmir Aydin motorway, which I will show you in one of the following slides. Okay, let, let's go to the next slide, which is the slide number 17. Slide number 17 gives you a view of the Shelatin Road Tunnel of the motorway Izmir Aydin in, in Turkey. 
I have been involved as the uh, general manager of that project on behalf of the uh, client at that time, where the construction was carried out by a joint venture, Kutlutas Dillingham. Kutlutas is a Turkish company. Dillingham is an American or has been an American company. I've been told it has been bankrupt. And the method which has been used for the construction of this tunnel is uh, the new Austrian tunneling method. The total cost uh, has been 121 million US dollars. It has been It has been a twin bore tunnel of uh, 3,016 meter of length, uh, different between the left and the right lane, uh, uh, left and right bound tunnel, with three lanes uh, of traffic in each direction. Each of the bores is 12, met is 12 meter wide and 4.8 meter high. The tunnel is equipped with modern electricity electronic road traffic safety system. Uh, speed limit is 80 uh, kilometers per hour, which can be reduced to 60 kilometers or 40 kilometers upon certain uh, traffic conditions. Dangerous goods carries are not permitted to use the tunnel. Contract model used has been a cost reimbursable unit price contract. And I can tell you, as a side note, that the whole uh, bill of quantities has been uh, summarized on one A4 size page of the contract. So no wonder the, 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 the contract was uh, successfully executed, but the cost uh, increase has been 500%. So let us go to the next uh, uh, slide which uh, gives you some uh, baselines on the unit price contract conditions. <clears throat> the unit price contract is based on units put in place rather than a single price. The payment is calculated at a specific rate for each item, for instance, concrete times quantity. The contractor quotes an owner a price for a particular task or scope of work, though at the time of contracting, the parties may not know the actual number of units of work uh, to be completed. That may be uh, the subject of the design also, if the design is not uh, uh, a detailed design. The owner does not have an exact final price till the project is finished. Shelatin Tunnel was one of these uh, examples. The utilized where quantity of work cannot be established, such as construction projects where excavation is involved. Unit cost contracts provide more flexibility. The unit uh, price contract is hardly used for entire project and is mostly applied to when contracting the subcontractors which identi uh, identification of different quantities are important. The unit price, uh, uh, unit price contract is not particularly useful for most private building projects, except uh, except for a lump sum or cost plus contract applied to select components of work items. Uh, and we will have uh, another example with the Kurang 2 uh, hydroelectric power plant in the following slide. Can we go to the following slide, please? Slide number 18. The Kurang Tunnel or Kurang uh, Hydroelectric Power Plant is located south of Chelgad and about 69 kilometers northwest of the Bakhtiari province. It has a capacity of 33 megawatt using water diverted to the east from Kurang, Rab, uh, Kurang River to produce power. Water is stored in Kurang 2 Dam before being sent to the power station. 
The water discharged from power station enters Zion, Zion Dech, uh, River to provide water to the city of Isfahan. The Kurang 3 dam is planned to divert future water to Sayande via Kurang 3 tunnel in 2010, supposed to use unit price contract model. Uh, this uh, tunnel has been uh, in construction for over 20 years. And during that years, also the original cost of the project has multiplied because there have been uh, a number of times changes of the construction technology from drill and blast to TBM to open gripper shield. And then uh, again, this has been done uh, a couple of times and increased the cost uh, significantly of that project. Okay, let's go to the next slide, number 20, to talk about another type of contract uh, which is a lump sum and scheduled uh, contract. The lump sum contract owner agrees to pay the contractor specified lump sum after completion of work without cost breakdown. No detailed measurement uh, is required. The lump sum and scheduled contract uh, provides completion of work as per plan and specifications carried out by contractor for a fixed amount as per the agreement. The owner provides required information and contractor charges certain amount. So lump sum and scheduled contract is defined as such. A lump sum uh, and scheduled contract is suitable when the number of items are limited or when it is possible to work out exact quantities of work to be executed. The detailed specifications of work plans and detailed drawing, security deposit, penalty progress, and other conditions are included in that type of contract. The contractor will be paid at regular interval of two to three months as per progress of work on the basis of certificate issued by the engineer in charge. A scheduled rate is included. A scheduled rate is in, included in the agreement for making payment of extra items. With regard to the fixed price for work to be done is agreed upon by client and contractor before the work begins. It can be more of a risk to the contractor as there are fewer mechanisms to allow them to vary price. Uh, and that's an example uh, from the construction of some sections of the Munich Metro uh, in Germany, and I would like to go to the next slide for the explanation and further deliberation of the Munich Metro. Slide number 21, please. Thank you for slide number 21. Munich Metro and the so-called Theresienwiese station. Slide number 21. It looks like Mr. Uteram is not in the, in the room. Okay. Munich Metro uh, is a station uh, of the München U-Bahn of line four and five, which has been completed in 1985. It is close, uh, uh, station, the station is close to the Oktoberfest grounds, very famous worldwide. Uh, which is not in October, but in September, <laughs> but they call it Oktoberfest. Uh, so the station is underneath that uh, uh, special area. The station has been constructed based on special technical proposals by the contractor. So the contractor made a special proposal uh, in the United States. It would have been called a value engineering. The, N the NITM, and that is remarkable, the NITM principles of that station 
have later been applied in many countries, among others in the United States, in Mexico, and in Korea. The contract model, and uh, which has been applied, has been lump sum and scheduled contract. So uh, the work for the contract, and I have been uh, the designer at that time. Uh, uh, at, the, at that time, it has been the biggest underground station in very soft ground uh, and, and shallow overburden, yes. Uh, uh, it has been a very tough uh, work for the contractor. And it was uh, a so-called uh, uh, binocular, binocular type of station. Uh, and uh, the uh, excavation area at the time has been a, approximately 180 uh, square meter quite big for shallow and soft ground. So let's go to the next station, uh, to the next slide, uh, when we talk about design build contracts. The construction team, which is also known as a design builder, is responsible for taking the owner's concept and completing a detailed design uh, before proceeding with the construction. Now, what are the advantages? First of all, the construction team is motivated to work with the architect or with the designer to develop a practical design. Second, the schedule in the design built contract uh, where the contractor is established at the outset and the construction activities can proceed concurrently with the design. So that looks to be some uh, time saving for the owner. And third, the incentive uh, advantage uh, is keeping a combined design and construction cost with, uh, within the owner's budget. Design and construction contracts can be awarded separately. Bidding takes place on preliminary plans in a not to be uh, in a not to exceed contract instead of a single firm design build contract. But there is a problem also, and the problem is the conflict of interest. The conflict of interest in design build uh, uh, works for the designer builder is not the owner. During construction, the architect normally acts as the owner's representative. The architect's role or the de designer's role is compromised when the designer works for the design builder and not for the owner directly uh, see the example which we just have seen. Uh, no, which we are going to see uh, with the next slide, which is a slide on the uh, Mexico Metro, okay? This metro is officially called uh, Sistema de Transporte Colectivo, uh, which is being a rapid transit system and serves the metropolitan area of Mexico City, including some of the neighboring municipalities in the state of Mexico. The uh, Sistema Colectivo <coughs> is the second largest metro system in North America after New York City subway. In 2019, uh, this uh, metro system served 1.6 billion passengers, placing it globally on number 10 highest ridership. What we see in the picture is the, the Takubaya station. The Takubaya station, together with eight more metro stations on line seven, was designed in 1985 using new Austrian tunneling method and using, as I mentioned, the binocular uh, system of the station design. The construction contract model was cost plus fixed fee. So, an amazing uh, amount of work has been done. And uh, uh, please note that uh, this Takubaya station is one out of eight more. So the total number on this uh, line 
7, linear 7. Uh, this line 7 has been nine metro stations, and all of them have been excavated underground. All of them have been using shuttle technology or NATM or uh, whatever you may, may call it, uh, uh, conventional tunneling very successfully. Uh, and the repetition from the project in Munich and from the project in for the Washington Metro. Okay, let's go to slide number 24, uh, which is the slide with the cost plus fixed fee contract. Tw uh, slide number 24, yes. Thank you. The cost plus fixed fee contract uh, is where the owner pays the contractor an agreed amount over and above the documented cost of work. This is a negotiated type of contract where actual and direct costs are paid for an additional fee, which is given for overhead and profit as normally not negotiated among the parties. The owner is in more control of the project. However, the risk are more transferred to the owner. So the owner takes, takes more risk in this type of contract. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, this type of contract is rarely to be found among uh, examples. The cost uh, plus contract states that the client agrees to reimburse a construction company for building expenses such as labor materials and other costs, plus additional payment usually stated as a percentage of the contractor's full price. So let me add, uh, unfortunately, I did not uh, include in this presentation a very interesting example from a hydropower station by the name of Alto Maipo in the south of Chile in South America, where this type of contract has been applied successfully for the contractor. I'm not so sure uh, as successfully for the, for the owner, but uh, I don't want to make any polemic situation out of that. Actually, it has been a very successful contract. The cost plus uh, contract is an alternative to lump sum agreement. It allows flexibility and transparency to the owner and reduces the risk for contractor since a cost plus construction contract guarantees them a profit, uh, which has been the case, uh, what I did show you a, as an example from the Shellatin Tunnel in Turkey. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And the next slide is a slide the, which shows an example from Austria, from one of the very successful uh, railway tunnel projects, which just recently, uh, or is actually in the completion and, and opening stage right now. So the uh, Koran tunnel uh, in the south uh, of Austria, uh, is, is a tunnel uh, with uh, roughly 30 kilometers of length. During the design process, preparation of cost estimate is imperative. So this uh, slide talks about cost estimate and the influence of GIS supported geological and geotechnical data, which provide an important input for a risk uh, based cost estimate. Considering a great number of risks and uncertainties, variation in cost could be determined in a realistic way to evaluate the risk. Uh, the first evaluation I've been involved in that in 1984, associated with financing the project, a contract model based on item rated uh, unit price. So this, this project really can be considered as a very successful uh, applied uh, contract model, uh, which has, reg I would call it regulated uh, changes, uh, regulated changes uh, and impact on, uh, on the uh, final uh, construction cost. Uh, 
It, it is a really a very good example for that. So let us go to the next uh, slide, which is slide number 26 on uh, cost plus contract. When a cost plus contract is utilized, it is better for the owner to determine the guaranteed maximum price to prevent any further cost and contractor needed to provide the primary input for owner about the project cost. So uh, all of this will be done in, in competition and uh, subject uh, of uh, uh, submittance. The cost plus GMP provides an upper limit on total construction cost and fees for which the owner is responsible. If the party providing the work under this pricing method runs over uh, the general uh, price, it is responsible for such overruns. It can be incentivized both parties to a construction contract to work together as efficiently as possible. The owner has more authorities in monitoring, inspecting and auditing the project periodically before ultimate payment. And the risk will be transferred from the owner to the contractor and this would be an attraction for the customer, uh, an attraction for, for instance, uh, the SJVNL Rampur project, as we can see in the following uh, example of a very successful hydropower plant in India. So let's go to uh, next slide, uh, slide number 27, which shows the example of the Rampur hydroelectric power plant, which is a 412 megawatt, quite big, uh, and which works in tandem with upstream 1,500 megawatt Napa Chakri uh, NJEP project and comprises headrest tunnel, tailrest tunnel, Sand stocks, powerhouse. Something is in the in the in the voice. Powerhouse, power evacuation system, and other components. Rampo Electric Hydropower Plant uses the desilted water from Napa Chakri, which eliminated the need for construction of a dam or a reservoir or even desilting chambers. The discharged water, the discharged water from uh, uh, N N NGHEP is carried downstream through a 15 kilometer concrete lined underground headrace tunnel constructed using uh, NATM drill and plast. And it happened in 2004. The contract is based on a subcontractor agreement at cost plus fixed fee. Subcontractors, uh, there have been several subcontractors, there have been three sections actually, and several subcontractors. One uh, of the subcontractors was from Korea. I have been uh, responsible as an advisor to the, <coughs> to the SJVNL. Okay. Still, the picture is not clear. Uh, let's go to the next slide, slide number 28. Slide number 28 talks about guarantee maximum price. Uh, it's another type of contract. So if in guaranteed maximum price, there is any savings resulted from cost underruns, then that would be stipulated price contract and the contractors will keep the savings obtained from the cost under runs. Saving can be shared by both contractor and owner in this type of contract. The lump sum contract may be used when the owner does have a complete set of construction plans, specifications and so on available. Otherwise, the guaranteed maximum price is preferred. When cost plus is utilized, it is better for the owner to determine the guaranteed maximum price 
to prevent any further cost. The contractor needed to provide the primary input for owner about project cost. Cost plus with the uh, guaranteed maximum price provides an upper limit on total construction cost and fees for which an owner is responsible. If the party providing the work under this pricing method runs over the uh, general, uh, the guaranteed maximum price, it is responsible for such overruns. The owner has no more authority in monitoring, inspecting, and auditing the project periodically because ultimate payments. Risk has been transferred from the owner to the contractor. And the example for such a contract is given in the next slide. The next slide, which shows you a tunnel in South America, uh, the so-called Buena Vista Tunnel in Colombia. It's a, a double lane uh, highway tunnel. In the meantime, there are two tubes. Each has uh, two lanes, uh, unidirectional lanes. And it is connecting the city of Via Vicenzo to the capital of uh, Colombia in Bogota, the so-called key component in the Autopista del Llano Highway. And it plays a vital role in the nation's transport network. It's stretching uh, about uh, 4.5 kilometers underground. And the tunnel is one of complex infrastructure changes. In Colombia, the tunnel has been contracted in 1998 on the base of a negotiated item contract. Tunnel has been uh, remarkable for several reasons, and the geotechnical, uh, really interesting point of this tunnel was that the horizontal convergency deformation because of uh, high pressure from, from, the, from the rocks, very uh, highly fractured rocks, as the convergency has in horizontal direction has been more than one meter. And to fix these, uh, uh, first of all, to fix this problem, uh, the estimated over uh, profile had to take into consideration uh, this high mountain pressure. And second, uh, it is remarkable because the high mountain pressure with the uh, following deformation uh, has uh, been resulted in the uh, installation of the support system. And uh, the only way to uh, get the support fixed was anchoring, uh, uh, so-called SN uh, anchors have been used. These are grouted anchors, and there have been uh, more than 300 meters of anchors, of anchor, uh, accumulated anchor length on one meter of tunnel length, but it has been uh, possible to, to uh, uh, stabilize and to install this support with a very, very highly motivated team. Now let's talk about the uh, slide number 30, which is the slide uh, which uh, reflects a very highly attractive and uh, very often used uh, type of uh, contract model. And that is the engineering procurement contract uh, can I ask for a slide number 20, uh, slide number 30? EPC contract or engineering procurement contract. The EPC contract are the most common form of contract used today to undertake construction works by the private sector on large scale and complex infrastructure projects. Under an EPC contract, a contractor is obliged to deliver a complete facility to a developer who need only turn a key to start operating the facility, 
Hence, EPC contracts are sometimes called uh, turnkey construction contracts also. The elderly version of, of uh, calling this type of contract was turnkey contract. The more new one is engineering procurement contract. However, the contractor must deliver complete that facility for a guaranteed price by a guaranteed date, and it must perform to the specified level. Failure to comply with any requirement will result in contractor incurring monetary liabilities, means losing money to the contractor. The EPC contractor coordinates all design, procurement, and construction work and ensures that the whole project is completed as required by quality and on time. The contractor may or may not undertake actual site works. He may use a subcontractor. Abbreviations used are uh, uh, LSDK for lump sum term key, uh, EPIC for engineering procurement and installation and commissioning, and EPCC for engineering procurement, construction, and commissioning. An example for that is uh, the next uh, example. Uh, the Metro of Bangkok in Thailand, which is an, an EPC contract type. Okay, let's go to next slide, uh, number 31. Slide number 31 uh, refers to the Bangkok Blue Line extension uh, construction. The contractor broke through using a 6.4 meter diameter EPBM, Earth Pressure Balance Shield method into the Sanam Chai station in Bangkok, marking the completion of the excavation of the westbound MRTA Blue Line extension in uh, contract number one in 2012. The Sanam Chai station, let me comment, is one of the most beautiful stations uh, of the metro, maybe the most beautiful station of the metro of Bangkok. It's near to the Chitralada Palace, near to the uh, Royal uh, Palace of, of the uh, King of Thailand. And it's worth to be visited uh, sometimes if you get a chance to come to Bangkok. I will be uh, delighted to uh, be your guide and to show you this Samnam Chai station. Uh, the tunnel boring machine bored this 2,800 meter long alignment in one pass, crossing two unexcavated stations at the time when it crossed and one ventilation shaft. The next drive <coughs> along the eastbound alignment of the line will have the stations completed as the TVM arrives. The contract metal used has been based on EPC construction contract model. Yes, all oh, great. Now I have the full, thank you very much. With slide number 31, uh, a new era uh, of the presentation on my screen has started. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? The next slide, slide number 32. It explains uh, four different functions of, of an EPC contract. And the first function of an EPC contract includes the basic engineering, includes the detailed engineering, includes the planning, and also the construction engineering. So all this is included in that EPC contract. The next... Uh, uh, function uh, relates to the procurement. The procurement function should include the logistics and the transport of the contract and of the project. 
The receiving uh, of the uh, project, the procurement as such, and it should include also invoicing and purchasing. The th uh, third function of an EPC contract is the function which should include the electrical installation, the electric me mechanical erection and installation, the civil engineering uh, construction, and also the geotechnical engineering. So it's a full comprehensive uh, uh, EPC contract function. And finally, it should include also commissioning, the function of the commissioning. And the after sale service, the testing and the commissioning as such, the modernization of plans and also the checking of the environment. So maybe we can go to the to the next slide, number 33. Slide number 33 is the slide which deals with uh, risk assessment. Risk assessment is, yes, slide number 33, please. The risk assessment is the formalized process of identifying hazards and evaluating their consequence and probability of occurrence together with strategies as appropriate for preventive and contingent actions. Please remember at that time the term ALAP as low as reasonable uh, possible. Huh? Uh, all that uh, sh should be part and, and should be combined in the risk assessment. Risk assessment also requires at each stage of a project uh, summarizing in appropriate risk registers. Risk registers are very, very important. There are rules for the uh, development of risk registers which should be followed. Risk register shall be clearly indicating the party which is responsible for the control and hence management of an identified risk respecting any contract responsibilities and liabilities as well as mitigation measures should be included in the risk assessment. The parameters which shall be used in the assessment of risk in terms of probability of occurrence of a hazard and its severity of impact and consequence on cost, on program, on environment, on third parties, and on existing facilities shall be both project specific and appropriate to the project stage under consideration. Different stages, different, uh, risk, uh, uh, different parameters and different risk assessments. The insurance should not be considered as a contingency or a mitigation measure in risk assessment for tunnel works. So, so far about risk assessment and uh, maybe we can go to the next slide which talks about uh, risk register slide number 34. What about the process of risk assessment and the subsequent preparation of risk registers? They are required to identify seven, identify and clarify ownership of risks and shall detail clearly and concisely how the risks are to be allocated, controlled, mitigated, and managed. So uh, seven of these uh, aspects will be discussed uh, in the following slides. The system, the management system used to track the risk shall enable the management and mitigation of risks through contingency measures and controls to be monitored through all stages of projects. We talked about project stages earlier. The risk register shall be a life document 
which is continually reviewed and revised as appropriate and available for scrutiny and at any time. Compliance uh, shall uh, provide an audible trail through the life of a project to demonstrate compliance with the code, whatever code is used, the code of practice of the tunnel insurance industry, the code of practice of the International Tunneling Association. All that uh, uh, is possible to be applied, but always should be in compliance with such code. They shall uh, identify hazards, risk register shall identify hazards, shall also uh, uh, evaluate consequent risk, mitigation and uh, contingency measures, proposed actions, responsibilities, critical dates for completion of actions, and when required actions to be closed out. So risk register is a key document for every contract. Next slide. Okay, now I have again, okay. Next slide, slide number 35. Is the risk assessment process. Uh, risk identified must be assessed as to their potential severity of impact, generally a negative impact such as damage or loss, and to the probability of occurrence. So these risks have to be uh, severely uh, assessed. The assessment process is critical to make the best educated decision in order to properly prioritize the implementation of the risk management plan. So risk register is of course part of the risk management plan. And uh, of course also as part of the whole risk assessment uh, process. The fundamental difficulty is to determine the rate of occurrence, evaluating the severity of the consequences with regard to the impact is often quite difficult for intangible assets. Asset evaluation needs to be addressed. Primary source of information is best educated opinion and available of statistics, availability of statistics. Risk assessment should produce such information that the risk management decisions may be prioritized within overall company goals. The most widely accepted formula for risk qualification is rate or probability of occurrence multiplied by the impact of the event equals the risk magnitude. magnitude. So the, the formula is rate of occurrence multiplied by impact of event, which equals the magnitude of the risk. So that can be uh, quite different uh, in the evaluation, but should be part of the negotiations uh, during uh, the stage of contract award and should be documented uh, as such also. Okay, next slide will be uh, slide number 36, the project uh, management plan. The project risk management should be based on competencies on, of, on employees willing to use them to achieve the project goal. Systems should track down all the processes and their exposure which occur in the project as well as circumstances that generate risk and determine their effects. So this system plan is uh, again very, very important and uh, should be tracked down during the process and the exposure uh, in, the con in, the, in the project. There are four elements to make trade-offs and track and to track program the status of uh, program. Uh, first of all, the cost, schedule, performance, and risk. 
These are one of the four elements. Uh, the other elements are international standards. For instance, the FIDIC uh, Emerald Book. Uh, the other element is risk management as such, which applies proactive to identify future problems. Another element is the understanding of consequences allowing predictive decisions. So uh, <clears throat> to understand this uh, better, we have to imagine to be at the open face uh, of a tunnel which is just in an excavation stage and we have to make uh, a prediction and to make uh, respective decisions on what kind of support will be used for the next uh, uh, meter of excavation. So that means that we have to understand the consequences and we have to make respective predictions. Another one uh, more uh, advanced uh, tool is the big data analysis, which appears as an emerging method, as an emerging method to create knowledge from uh, data being generated by different sources in a production process. We have entered the age where data are imperative and data based on experience are imperative in order to make uh, decisions and in order to drive a tunnel and to use a respective uh, contract model in a tunnel. So more and more of this data management will happen in, in, in the future. Uh, but my prediction is also that uh, it will never fully uh, replace experience. Uh, and experience is something uh, which uh, only comes by time. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, slide number 36. Slide number 37, uh, excuse me. Slide number 37. Uh, it gives some uh, explanation on project risk management. Uh, on, on the risk assessment matrix, risk assessment matrix. Okay. Uh, risk uh, is defined as the lack of certainty about the outcome of making a particular choice. The level of downside can be calculated as the product of the probability that harm occurs multiplied by the severity of that harm for instance, the average amount of harm or more conservatively, the maximum credible amount of harm. So this is the definition of risk, lack of certainty. Our business is uh, the business uh, of handling uncertainty. A risk matrix is a useful approach where either the probability or the harm severity cannot be estimated with accuracy and precision. That's the definition of probability. A risk matrix is a matrix that is used during risk assessment to define the level of risk by considering the category of probability or the likelihood against the category of consequences uh, and severity. It is a simple mechanism to increase visibility of risks and assist management decision making. So <clears throat> again, the essential need for uh, risk assessment and all of the uh, uh, sub documents of risk assessment like risk register, like uh, uh, risk uh, program and so on, so all this is uh, basically serving uh, to improve and to increase the visibility of risk and to, to insist and to insist uh, decision making and to uh, assist, not insist, but to assist uh, decision making of the management. Okay, the next slide is a very uh, simple and easy to understand risk matrix. 
where we have uh, pro probability and uh, harm severity. And the organization should calculate what levels of risk it can take with different events. This would be done by weighing the risk of an event occurring against cost to implement safety and uh, benefit gained from it under the aspect of uh, ALAP principles, using ALAP principles as low as possible uh, uh, mitigation measures. Now, <clears throat> harm severity is uh, uh, gradually uh, starting uh, with neglectable uh, harms, with marginal harms, critical harms, and with catastrophic harms. And the probability starts with uh, uh, the certainty of uh, an, an event, a certain uh, event with the likelihood of the event, the possibility, unlikely, the rare and the eliminate uh, probability. If there is no probability, then uh, it means elimination. Now, this risk metric has to be done uh, individually for each risk and uh, should uh, be uh, provided in the risk register and in the risk management process. Okay, uh, let's go uh, to, the, to the next slide, uh, slide number 39, which is monitoring risk and controlling process. Uh, <clears throat> in summary, the risk management must become part of every civil engineering project. It's a must. A step as basic as scheduling and budgeting risk management, scheduling, and budgeting on the same level. And it such becomes a key ingredient to all communication channels. In the, uh, in the graph, we can see the, the planning process of a group, uh, which uh, uh, enters from planning to execution through communications, which uh, should include performance reporting, scope uh, and uh, verification, time with regard to schedule control, and uh, procurement with regard to quality control. There is uh, also uh, an integrated uh, change control has to be provided. The scope change control has to be provided. The cost control as well, as well as in regard to procurement, risk monitoring and control. It finally ends up uh, with the close out of the group of the processes. Okay, that is uh, risk monitoring and uh, the simplified uh, controlling process of risk monitoring. So we come to the uh, conclusion uh, and the uh, slide number 40, which uh, refers to uh, summary and to conclusions. Slide number 40 uh, also uh, shows the critical path. There are six phases of a big project, uh, which is taken on the outcome with an unspoken assumption about their seemingly inherent tendency towards cows. <laughs> so this is a uh, cow theory, part of cow theory, uh, that we have these uh, six phases. The planning process, if not carried through with wisdom and common sense, might progress along the following critical paths. Uh, this starts, this progress starts uh, at the beginning with an unlimited enthusiasm. Uh, phase number one. Phase number two, it's a total phase of disillusionment. After that uh, total in disillusionment, we enter into the phase of utter chaos. From there, we enter into the phase number four, uh, searching for those who are guilty. 
from uh, uh, the next phase, uh, we have faced uh, entered the punishment for the innocent and finally the promotion of the non-participant. So this is a, a, a kind of a sarcastic uh, view of a critical path, uh, which is uh, elaborated on uh, several publications, on several conferences, and uh, has been understood as such that it happens uh, in, 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 in many projects. Uh, but knowing about it uh, prevents also, in particular, when we uh, have been undergone the development of uh, choosing an appropriate contract model and uh, making an uh, appropriate risk assessment, then we may learn uh, from that. In summary, uh, engineers shall assess and manage risk and thereby reduce the incidence and effects of natural and man-made disasters. We, are, we have entered the age of uh, climate change. We have entered the, the, the age of sea level rise. Uh, all uh, our education and all our knowledge about the uh, civil engineering is in, in uh, urgent need. Uh, we need to have uh, very well knowledgeable and uh, very well educated uh, civil engineer in order to face the future of our, uh, of our planet. Now, uh, I would like to finish with a uh, quotation from uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, many people know about Albert Einstein, one of the big uh, thinkers, Nobel Prize laureate, of course, of the last century, uh, who has done uh, really pioneering work in uh, uh, defining the, the uh, ESMC square formula and uh, uh, in, the, in the general relativity theory and in the specific the uh, relative uh, theory, uh, theory. Also, uh, the, the father of quantum mechanics, uh, which uh, I think is uh, driving uh, our uh, civilization and in, in, at the moment in uh, uh, underground caverns in in uh, Lausanne in in Switzerland with the with the big sun uh, uh, project there however what he said is learning from yesterday living today and hoping for tomorrow that is our formula the important issue according to Albert Einstein is not to stop questioning so always we have uh, to to ask uh, and to, to, to come to answers, uh, uh, to simple answers with, which everybody can understand. So with that, I would like to conclude and uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, very delighted and open uh, to uh, uh, question and answers uh, right now. So far, anyhow, thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello? Yeah, Dr. Wagner, I think there is, there is a question here from Ramesh uh, and Mishra. Okay, I'm, I'm prepared to listen and to answer. Yeah, yeah, uh, Ramesh, you, you can shoot your question. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ramesh Narayan Mishra, and uh, it is always a pleasure to listen the talks of Dr. Wagner, who is Thank a highly you. learned person, highly learned professional in the field. Thank and, you. Thank uh, you. Your uh, talk was really wonderful, especially the when you summarized, you said it is sarcasm. 
but you told the truth and okay. that is the truth which a professional in a hydropower and tunnel industry faces there are so many issues which uh, involved in the tunneling uh, because the time is short therefore i would like to put one issue before dr wagner for his advice okay uh, in the contract type of guaranteed maximum price yes epc the prices get fixed it means the contract up to a certain amount the owner or employer is supposed to pay beyond that amount it is the responsibility or it is the liability of the contractor to bear the cost overrun but such a situation may arise that the contractor finds that the cost overrun has gone beyond his financial capability yes in such a situation what would be your advice for midway correction whether it can be done it should be done or it should not be done if it can be done what could be the way what could be the methodology or uh, any you if you uh, make give your suggest suggest some way you know very interesting question thank you very much uh you know that uh, different different feelings uh, storm through my through my thinking first of all i think uh, in our tunneling industry we highly depend on the contractor the contractor is the one who has to build the tunnel the contractor is the one who uh, also is uh, facing the risk and the contractor is is the one who finally has to survive uh, we have had uh, in my professional life several examples where uh, contractors bankrupt because uh, they could not uh, sustain what has been what has been uh, uh, what what has been met on on the on the field so uh, keeping in mind that we need the construction industry the contractor to perform and and to 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 build our tunnels on the other side we know that the contractors are uh, also speculating and uh, the contractors have to be knowledgeable and have to prove that they are knowledgeable that that means that uh, if we give a contractor a fixed uh, lump sum price contract we have to be sure that this contractor has the ability has the equipment the experience of his people and so on to perform the contract otherwise we cannot give him the contract that means that the evaluation of the quality of the contractor uh, is very very important so uh, uh, the the selection process uh, is very Im important and very necessary to to find a, a reliable contractor and you you know that the the, the bigger the contractors become the less uh, the less overseeable their actions are the contractor may have uh, an obligation to perform uh, in our tunnel contract but he has some other business uh, and some other risks also which has nothing to do with the, with the project and nothing to do with with tunnels at all but uh, he is running out of money because uh, he has speculated in another field and uh, so he he tried to to get more money from the tunnel contract because typically the tunnel contract uh, and the 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 deal with the greater uncertainty uh, seems to give him more attraction to uh, uh, to to give a, uh, a, a 
a price which is attractive and which finally uh, would lead to a contract award also. So I, I think the selection of the contract is very important, but uh, as important is the selection of the contract model and also of the risk analysis, you know, uh, the, the risk assessment uh, and the understanding of the risk. Uh, and in that regard, I would uh, once again like to, to underline the importance of the geotechnical baseline report, because in the geotechnical baseline report, we have to define the geotechnical conditions and we have to define uh, the, uh, also the uh, conditions which the contractor is to, to face in construction depending on the technology which he is using. So sometimes, you know, we have a, we have a, uh, a contract which has been uh, developed under high time pressure. Under, under high time pressure, then uh, we would like to see uh, only the, the basic design uh, from, the, uh, from the client side, from the owner side, and give it to the contractors in a, in a competition and uh, show uh, in the basic design just the very, very necessary uh, details. Like I mentioned, the contract uh, uh, for the Shelatin tunnel, which was a uh, 250 originally, no, uh, originally almost $400 million project and which finally uh, end up after 10 years uh, with, with a, a contract uh, amount of uh, uh, $1.5 billion, you know. So that, that has uh, multiplied almost by five. So we don't want to, to see that, but <laughs> What can you do if you have a bill of quantity which is uh, uh, which is a one-page DIN A4 site uh, page, and uh, uh, if there is no almost no uh, geotechnical baseline, no geotechnical description, but you want to get the the work done and you want to have a connection from Izmir to Aydin, which is 250 kilometers across Turkey. So what what you what you can do you you do you make a, a unit price or negotiated price or uh, you you make a cost plus fee contract and therefore I'm I'm uh, the the solution is we need to spend time on the development of the contract uh, documents on the development of the geotechnical baseline report on the development of the bill of quantities on the development of the design and all this if it is highly specified you reduce the risk to to run into uncomfortable conditions at the end of the contract uh, where you have uh, arbitration and where you have uh, all sorts of of difficulties and in, instead of uh, uh, the engineers you have the lawyers uh, which take the word and the court, uh, it becomes a court case. All that we don't want. We want to spend time on the development of a specific project. We want to uh, uh, specify as much as possible. We, we never will be uh, free of any uncertainties. There's, there's always an uncertainty. But we, we have to understand that we have to, to do as much as we can in order to define this, the, the un uncertainties uh, in the contract document. And then we can be sure that our contract will be a success and will be satisfying both uh, the owner and the contractor. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I, I, if you have further questions, please, you can also write it down and I will respond in, in writing. If you give uh, the... A uh, question to the uh, Paneling Association of India or to the Central Board of Irrigation and Power, and they will uh, transfer the question to me, and I will be happy to answer you in writing also. So, 
Mr. Mr. Wagner. Yes. Uh, good evening. This is DK Sharma. Good evening. Good evening. You are very very glad to 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 be with you. Yeah, same here. Thank you. I just wanted to um, thank you for your concluding slide, wherein you said that the climate change is happening and all civil engineers have to do extra for that. Right. I would fully agree when maybe uh, this is the time when all civil engineers would need to work extra in view of the fact that all the standards and the specifications they have laid down need to be rewritten. Right. Unless we get, maybe we <clears throat> would get caught. And uh, <clears throat> I find that more relevant in the field of uh, water resources. Though I would uh, say, I would request you to kindly give us a little bit more insight into uh, how it would affect our tunneling broadly. Just a little bit, very, very quick remark from your side. Okay. Yeah. Well, how, how tunneling projects are affected and what is the future of tunneling projects in regard or in the context of, of, of climate change and sea level rise. Yes. I'm, I'm very happy to provide that information to you. But uh, ahead of the written information, just uh, let me point out that, uh, you know, most of our mega cities, of our big cities on a global scale, are in uh, areas uh, where, uh, in coastal areas, basically, and in coastal areas, uh, we have Bangkok, Jakarta, we have uh, uh, Rio, we have New York, we have so Shanghai and so on. You know, in all these areas, uh, we need, in my opinion, we need tunnels for flood protection. And it is easy to, to install these, these tunnels because there is no major, uh, there is the lining which we have to install and then the tunnel will be used for flood protection and uh, uh, can protect our, our cities, maybe in, in, the, in the context of some additional uh, uh, coastal protection, uh, like we have, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, where we have gained land from the sea. Uh, if we take the example of Singapore, you know, Singapore, uh, some 20, 30 years ago, had a size of 500 square kilometers. Now they have uh, reclaimed land from the sea and uh, uh, they have more than uh, 700, 725 uh, square kilometers already, but they have to protect it uh, from the sea level rise. Uh, if we take, for instance, the melting ice from uh, Greenland, uh, if we take uh, this melting ice, uh, if, it's, if it melts all, the uh, sea level will rise by more than six meters worldwide. You know, 80% eight, of uh, our planet is covered with water. You can imagine if, if, if the water, it will not, it will not be uh, melting all of that, but uh, by the end of the century, we may expect one meter of sea level rise. And sea level rise one meter means that Bangkok would be flooded, that uh, uh, Singapore would be flooded, uh, Shanghai would be flooded, and so on. So tunnels are the, uh, I call it the blood of the infrastructure, the blood channels of the infrastructure is the tunneling. And tunnel engineers have a huge responsibility to preserve culture and to prever uh, preserve civilization. And from that point of view, uh, yes, I would like to give you a written answer also on that because there's too much which uh, is uh, browsing through my head right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for right. your such insight into it. And uh, I would appreciate if you can kindly send it to um, Sunil Sharma. Or, or okay. I'll pass on my email address to Sunil Sharma so that uh, or I'll take your email from Sunil Sharma and uh, I'll uh, send a mail to you. Thank you very much. Very, I, very appreciate. And I can see my good friend, old friend, Mr. Mishra also. Good evening, sir. Okay.
Thank you very much. Good evening. Much. It's really Good pleasure evening. to see all of you. And uh, actually, Dr. Wagner used to come to uh, this uh, SJVN for that Rampur project mm -hmm. when I was a director civil. And uh, then also we used to have a lot of discussions and he used to guide us on the Rampur tunnel and that uh, powerhouse. Fantastic, fantastic work we have done. I, I, I really am delighted to remember that. It was yeah, very, yeah. very exciting. And then on Luhuri tunnel, Luhuri project also, you had been uh, uh, giving a, uh, a lot of, the you Luhuri. had been, for Luhuri that when it was being done, twin tunnels, Yes, that was the original proposal. Then also, so 20, and, uh, you have been telling about the TBM and DBM and all those things. So right. it's always a pleasure to listen to Dr. Wagner and to talk to him. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Lori was an exciting project, you know, yeah. the two times thirty-six kilometers uh, tunnel system, and uh, we really, we really have been touching. Uh, the the ultimate end of technology uh, which we wanted to apply there, but I, I tell you, I am still sure Luri will happen. It will happen sometimes. Projects sometimes have have a very long time uh, where uh, we are pregnant with the project. You know, is is but the the moment of birth is coming, and there are many other projects right now. And I, I tell you, uh, on, a, on, a, on a global scale, the tunneling industry is really in a fantastic blooming era. And uh, we will have so many, like India is a fantastic example for that also. Uh, because India has so many projects uh, now in, in construction and, and many more in, in design stage. And so much interest is there in India so I I'm, I'm really would like to remember our young, uh, young engineers that their responsibility is the responsibility of an underground infrastructure to carry the blood of our civilization uh, from, from uh, our civilization. That is, that is what we have to understand and that is a fantastic honorable uh, uh, responsibility. So and with Luhuri work? has been the layout of Luhuri has been changed. Now it is it has been put into dam to powerhouse, divided okay. into three stages. And uh, uh, I am the basically I was the culprit who changed oh. it from. <laughs> Congratulations! Congratulations! <laughs> and when uh, actually the. Uh, there were a lot of apprehension, especially the state government was very much apprehensive about the uh, tunnel. And okay. the, the then chief minister was very much apprehensive. So considering uh, everything, when I was chairman, managing director, so I changed it to the, I changed the layout. So okay. I'm the culprit of not making the twin tunnels of Luhri. <laughs> okay, fantastic, good. So what is the size of Luri right now, the diameter? Yeah, actually, the, uh, all the three added together is almost the same. OK. Same. But first stage is being has been awarded. I think it is first stage. I do not remember exactly. This is 165 megawatt or something. This has okay. been already awarded to one party. So oh, okay. It has a dam and powerhouse, dam to powerhouse. Fantastic. Dam is at the same place where it was envisaged at your time. Oh, OK. Simply. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. OK. So I'm also, I also retired from there three and a half years back almost. Oh, yeah. great. You, you enjoy retirement. Yes, I'm enjoying my retirement. Yes, yes. On, on the one side. On the other side, you are still very, very involved in, in the in the actual projects, it looks to me. Yeah, actually, I'm working on some few boards as independent director. And uh -huh. I'm also adjunct professor in Institute of Indian Institute of Technology, Rurki. So in I'm Rurki. teaching there. Yeah. Very so well known. Way, yeah. And Famous. also, some, yeah, so that's why I'm sub arbitration uh, panels. So that's why I'm 
little involved and uh, i am keeping myself busy so that okay. uh, <laughs> i am i remain healthy and uh, my mind yeah. is always active <laughs> very very lucky for for our discipline congratulations thank you very much thank you very much it was really pleasure to meet everybody i thank cvip that they invited me and uh, uh, this uh, to patel saab uh, i got this uh, only today i got that the mail and uh, i thought that i should definitely come to this and attend this webinar and especially when i saw the name of dr wagner <laughs> thank you thank you so much very very thank kind you. of you thank you thank you so thank you <laughs> wagner and uh, we are ready for 19th may what you mentioned for the confirmation of the next program yes 19th of may is, is okay yes. for you yes it is okay for us okay okay then let's make it may 19 yes may 19 for the life cycle assessment and all okay same same time yeah same three, time. three to 5 yes okay Okay, great, great. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Sharma thank, ji. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Khaji. Thank you very thank much, Dr. Sharma. Dinka sir and thank you, Patel sir, for all. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sunil. Thank you. And let me say thank big you. thank you to uh, Dr. Wagner for uh, delivering this very valuable speech. And Tunnelling Association of India is really indebted to you and uh, your uh, uh, this. Uh, talks on different uh, topics regarding tunneling have been very useful, and uh, I have uh, some of the I see regularly some of the uh, engineers, the, the best tunneling engineers in the country, like uh, Mr. Kali, who attends your programs very regularly. So similarly, there are some other uh, people also who attend these programs regularly, and big big thank you to you for. Uh, Uh, imparting knowledge to indian engineers and also i, I have a request here to uh, mr sunil sharma and his team to make sure that uh, we uh, have more and more people attending these uh, webinars thank you once again and thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank you thank you very much thanks goodbye thank you i appreciate a lot goodbye thank you Thank you.